And let me introduce Annie. Um, Annie has been buying and selling, but mostly collecting for 30 years. She's a past president of National Button Society and serves as judging chairman at New Jersey State Button Society and the Pennsylvania Button Society. She is a classification co-chair of Division I for the National Button Society and a board member of the Florida State Button Society. And I would like to welcome Annie. Hi, y'all. Um, it's nice to be here. We're going to do a um, shell button study. This is going to be part one. We've divided the shell class. I've decided to divide the study of the shell classification into small bites. Um, I think it'll be easier for everybody to absorb and you won't, hopefully you won't get too bored. I fell in love with shell and pearl buttons the very first time I saw them. And they're still my number one favorites. So during this time of sheltering in place, I decided to study my buttons and reread some of my reference material on shell buttons. Even if you don't compete, but love pearl buttons, I highly recommend this booklet, Pearl and Shell, A Complete Classification. It's published by the National Button Society and it's available for purchase on their website for $8. A picture's worth a thousand words and this booklet provides that, examples of all the classes we're going to study. I also recommend the link on the web to buttoncountry.com. This is a site that was originally uh, produced by Paul Rice um, sadly, he passed. He was a he was a member of the National Button Society, and sadly, he passed away uh, a few years ago. And the site is now being maintained by the National Button Society. You can get to that link on your own or through uh, NBS website. Um, it's full of information about shell buttons, and actually, it's full of information about any kind of button material you may be interested in. So if you can get to buttoncountry.com, uh, it's well worth it. Thank you. Okay, Be, uh, before we start the study, I do wanna recommend another book that I've just read. It's called Shell Games by Jeffrey Copeland. It's the true story about Pearl McGill who worked in a button factory in Muscatine, Iowa in the early 1900s. Muscatine uh, had many button factories and produced millions of buttons in the first half of the 20th century. It was known as the pearl button capital of the world. The process of making shell buttons is described in detail in the book. You will be amazed at how complicated and hazardous it was. Pearl McGill was so appalled by the working conditions there that she became an activist to get better wages and safer conditions for the employees. It's a good read and it will make you appreciate the common pearl shirt buttons that you see on these pretty original cards. I purchased the book from Amazon. Um, we had a couple of people that did show and tell in our a meet and greet um, an hour ago showing, showing the uh, pearl cards and all of them came out of Muscatine. There, Muscat there is also a museum in Muscatine, Iowa, Iowa, dedicated to pearl buttons. You can find information about that online as well. Now on to the classification of shell. The National Bun Society divides shell buttons into two categories, iridescent and non-iridescent. I wanna show you examples of both types along with the shells used to make them and some clues how to identify them. The majority of antique and vintage shell buttons were made from pearl oyster. These range in color from white to brown, yellowish to gray. This includes the buttons that we sometimes refer to as Tahiti pearl and smoky pearl, not just the white ones. On the left, you have a polished, and, and unpolished uh, pearl oyster shells. 
along with the buttons showing the color variation along here. On the right, some examples as well. Minerva is carved white on top and goes into the darker part of the shell. Esmeralda and the dancing goat escutcheon is pinned to a dark oyster pearl, but the back of this particular button is bright white. And Bethlehem pearl buttons uh, are always carved out of the whitest parts of the shell. The bottom shows a smoky pearl button with the in-between color. Here are more beautiful examples of oyster pearl buttons. They were perfect vehicles for engraving, as you can see in the hunting scene. The center button is cameo carved, and it uses both the light and dark parts of the shell. And the bottom right, this is a, an 18th century pearl, uh, oyster pearl button. Uh, and for 18th century buttons, they used mostly oyster pearl. Most of them were white. As you can see in the photo, the artist who carved the button would determine which layer he wanted to feature, dark to light or light to dark. Notice the thickness of the shell and the layers of color. This is the Minerva button I showed you previously, which has a dark back, uh, has the bark on it, which is the outside of the shell that's still there. The brown center and then a white top. Check the back of your buttons for clues as to what type of shell was used to make it. And here you can see they used the dark as the background and the white cameo. Mostly you see it uh, with a white back and a dark cameo. Some of the prettiest buttons out there are made from abalone shell. You'll probably hear me say some of the prettiest out there a lot because I love my pearl buttons. <laughs> and uh, pictured here are the outside and the inside of an abalone shell. The buttons have a beautiful sheen in pinks and greens all the way to peacock blue. Look at the center photo with abalone buttons in various colors. Note that the backs on some of these buttons have some of the original orange bark. The button on the left even incorporates the bark into the design. On the right is a good example of abalone shell over white oyster pearl. Here are more examples using the exquisite peacock blue parts of the abalone shell. On the top left, abalone is used as decorative inlay in pearl oyster. On the bottom left, the maker managed to use the chunky part of the shell to create a button. The center button uses abalone as a base and contrasts it with white oyster on top. The two photos on the right picture mm -hmm. modern abalone buttons. You might hear them referenced as power buttons, uh, and they're usually paper thin, especially any you, you might buy today in, in a Notion store. Uh, cleverly enough, the bottom set from New Zealand fortifies a very thin slice of shell with a clear lacquer of epoxy to give it strength and substance. Hmm. Green snail shell was also used to make buttons. Some of the prettiest out there. There I go again. The bark, the outside of the shell is green brown and the polished interior is a lustrous cream with pink and green notes. Note the back of the sew through button. If there is green bark, you can be fairly certain it is a green snail shell. Here you can see how lustrous it is. 
it refracts the light. So you can see those hints of pink and green, iridescence. And the carved, I think it's a Cupid. It might be a warrior, I'm not too sure, but it is one of my favorite um, pearl buttons. Um, here are some more examples that illustrate the creaminess. The back of the circus rider button is lustrous, just like the fronts of the other buttons pictured. You may think it's difficult to tell the difference between some abalone and green snail, but it's clearer when we look at some examples side by side, which we will do next. But in the meantime, here you can see um, this is a laminated pearl down here on the bottom right, and they put together uh, the cream parts of the green snail and in between some of the bark color. And this with an escutcheon. And now, side by side, I want to be able to show you the difference. As you can see, the green snail buttons are more uniform in color compared to the abalone. It's the striations of color that you see here, almost like a rainbow effect, that makes it easier to tell them apart. Now, when you look at this button here, at first glance, you might think it's abalone. Uh, but it does have some green bark on the on this side and some brown and green bark and this is the back of it so you can confirm that it is um, a green snail shell um, more modern because it has a plastic glued on shank but it's interesting the way they uh, carved into the different color layers and it gives you a chance to really see that on zoom there you go and you can see all the rainbow effects that you get with abalone. That's how you would tell the difference. Make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Okay. The next basic category of buttons are those made of non-iridescent shell. Here we have helmet shell, conch shell, cowrie shell, and pinna shell. Uh, let's start with the helmet shell pictured. This is the shell most commonly used for cameo jewelry. Looking at the cameo carved buttons, you can see the similarity. In fact, it is probable that the same artists were carving buttons as well as jewelry. There is variation into the depth of color in this class as well. All of my examples, interestingly enough, are set in metal. I, I don't have any that are not set in metal in a helmet shell. Conch shell buttons are not common, but at least they are easy to identify. Well, I say that except uh, you have to keep in mind that the pink color of the conch shell will fade over time when exposed to light. On the left, conch is used to embellish a cameo carved oyster pearl button. The two pin shank buttons on the bottom right are both 18th century and they just don't have as much pink coloring. I, they've been around a long time, so that might be the reason. Cowrie shell is often carved, revealing its interesting bark, as the example shown. The center button is not carved, but it gets its drama from the speckled shell itself. The cameo carved building on the right uses the bark as highlights in the design. And the turtle on the left mimics the color of a real turtle shell. Pinna shell, also sometimes called pen shell, 
the top left will show you a polished pinnace shell that's used in the production production of the two buttons shown. And this is uh, two uh, pinnace shells that are shown on the beach. Um, buttons in Division One, and for those of you um, who don't know, Division One are buttons that are made before 1918, approximately that time period. They're very rare. Here are two beautiful uh, Division One pinnace shell buttons that, when held up to the light, are quite translucent in the thinner edges. In the 1990s, New Jersey's own Nancy Du Bois started making engraved black pen shell buttons. Pin a shell, pen shell is used interchangeably. It's another name. Um, she found a source for pen shell discs and started uh, making her designs. She also made our 75th anniversary button a few years ago as pictured on the left with some of the last of the black pen shell discs she had left. This one is from my own collection um, where she uses the uh, pearl oyster to make the clouds and she on top of the uh, pen shell. Uh, shell harvesters were no longer able to harvest black pen shell and Nancy's sources for raw materials dried up. I had the honor of selling her buttons for many years and could never resist buying a few for my own collection, as pictured here. Um, cherish your Nancy Du Bois pen shell buttons, as there very likely will be no more. She had, she always had such uh, whimsical ideas, and I mean, here's the clock. She's got oyster shell, uh, oyster pearl uh, weights on the bottom of the clock. And this is a movable where the windmill moves. Uh, next time we'll, we'll continue with the shell classification and look at decorative finishes and mechanical makeup. Um, if you have the ability to send me photos of some of your shell buttons via phone or computer, please do so. I'd love to include them in our next few presentations. Um, just send them to me at um, antiquebuttons at gmail.com. Make sure you're watching our New Jersey State Button Society Facebook page and our website for the times and dates of, that, of my next presentation. Buy yourself a copy of the Pearl and Shell Classification Booklet from NBS, $8. Um, and feel free to email me with your questions anytime. You can follow me on Facebook, Annie Fraser Antique Buttons. Um, and I have a, an Etsy shop, which is Annie Fraser, no space in between. So thank you. And that's my presentation. Oh, thank you, Annie. So does anyone have any questions for Annie? So I'm gonna First of all, um, everybody raise a big thumb or uh, you can unmute yourselves and say, yay, yeah, 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 Annie, that was great. <laughs> yes, you did do a great job. That was great. Awesome. Yeah. It's Thank so you. exciting. It's so well exciting. Here we go into the 21st century with buttons. 200 years later, we're looking at these pearl wonderful exciting buttons from an expert i am so excited about the future of our hobby that's really great anybody want to say anything else about that you can unmute yourself we have one question in chat also um karen it was your question in chat what's your question um i i had the impression that you said but i didn't catch it if, if the power shell is the same as abalone yes and it's a type of abalone Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Okay. I will say that you brought up all kinds of stuff I didn't know about shells. So this was like really informative. Thank you. Thank it you. It was very informative. Okay. Um, Jade Papa has a question. Where do helmet shells originate in the world? 
Um, a lot of a lot of the shells um, are from the Pacific Ocean. Thank you. Of course, you know you you know that if you went to Joann Fabrics and bought shell buttons today, they're super thin. And there's a couple of reasons for, well, there's a basic reasons for that. Um, because of the over harvesting in years gone by, um, and the fact of the, of the pollution in the oceans, the shells don't grow thick like they used to. And, and oh. consequently, you won't, won't see uh, big thick shells like you do. Even the plain ones are, are tiny thin ones now. Annie, I actually, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Is there a way to visually tell the difference between like the muscatine mussel shell buttons and the pearl ocean shell buttons? To me, they don't look quite as lustrous. The muscatine, the muscatine mussel buttons seem, I mean, honestly, when I started restudying, I was surprised that they're in the, uh, iridescent section. I would have thought they would have been considered non-iridescent because many times you see them and they don't have a, any shimmer to them. Mm -hmm. um, and they just don't seem quite as pretty is the word I want to think of. They're, they're plainer. I mean, look at all those, look at all those original cards with the shirt buttons on them. Those buttons don't have that, uh, I think the word is chatoyance, the luster and the different coloring that you'll see in a regular um, uh, pearl oyster shell. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, if um, two, two, 201, did you have a question? Um, am I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I love pearl buttons too. And I think I have that classification classification book. So I'm going to go up and, um, and look for that in my button room. And um, I'm going to order that book because I, I, it sounds very interesting, Annie. Thank you for the recommendation. But as far as questions, uh, it would take all day to answer all the questions <laughs> I have. <laughs> but anyway, I'm learning. I'm still learning. Every day you learn something new. And I've done uh, quite a bit of sorting of buttons this summer. But um, I have a long way to go to get it organized. I, ha I must have a million buttons, <laughs> at least. Well, this is wonderful. I love this. I can't believe that I actually was able to get it all straight and do it because I'm not a very computer, you know, oriented person other than playing words with friends. <laughs> well, P Pam, you, you are the, uh, the, uh, be the, the lead in what we're hoping to do, which is to get more people conversant with staying together virtually, because that's that's going to be our help this winter. I agree. Well, so we I talked to Joanne Taylor, and she could not do it because she she signed wrong on with the speaker. Or she signed on. Yeah. But but her speaker, she said, is not working on her computer. So because uh, okay. I I told her I was going to try, you know. Anyway, so, so this is a good a good reminder that we're going to post either this actual um, video on the website and Facebook page, or Annie is going to make a special one. I have one more question. Okay. Another question, sure, Lorraine. Uh, my question is: If a pearl set in metal, and you showed some that were Annie, mm -hmm. is it a metal button or a pearl button? Pearl button. Everything set in metal except glass is the material inside. So if you have, and, and it's actually when we get further down into the classification, you'll see that one of the things you should have, there is a class just for pearl buttons set in metal. So oh, really? Considered pearl buttons. Uh, vegetable oh. ivory set in metal is a, considered a vegetable ivory button. Wood okay. set in metal is still a wood button. And celluloid set in metal or on it still is celluloid. Yes. Mm. Okay, thanks. 